Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm Benedict Walter from the Secretariat of the Network for Improving Quality of Care for Maternity Newborn and Child Health. Welcome to what is the fourth webinar in a series on delivering quality essential maternal newborn and child health services in the time of COVID-19. Today's session is dedicated to oxygen systems for children and newborns. This series of webinars is co-hosted by the Network for Improving Quality of Care for MNCH and the QOC subgroup of the Child Health Task Force with the support of UNICEF and the World Health Organization. We will have about 35 minutes of presentation by four different speakers, followed by 25 minutes of questions and answers. You will see that you're all muted today, but we're asking you to post your question and your comment in the chat box in the bottom right part of your screen. We will read them out at the end of the webinar and the panelists will have a chance to answer. For the question that we do not have the time to answer, we will direct you to a committee of practice where you can track down further answers and you can also post further questions. We are recording to these sessions and we will send you a link with the recording and all the presentations later today. We are also currently broadcasting live on YouTube. I'm now handing over to today's facilitators, Dr. Annie Detien, Health Specialist, ICCM, IMCI at UNICEF, and Dr. Pavani Ram, Senior Medical Advisor for Child Health at USCID. Over to you. Thank you very much, Bene, and greetings to everyone. Thank you very much for joining. As Bene indicated, we are um, highlighting this series uh, because we are recognizing the impacts that COVID-19 is having um, on the delivery of essential maternal newborn and child health services during this time and the challenges that are being experienced not only in terms of coverage of care but also the quality of care. Next slide please. Ben. So here we're sharing um, some potential implications across the various quality domains uh, in the table on the bottom left around effectiveness, safety, people-centeredness, timeliness, equity, integration, and efficiency. And the aspects of those domains that are um, potentially challenged in the delivery of care uh, under stressed health systems during the pandemic. So how during this time can we focus on supporting, strengthening the quality of care and the pillars of quality planning, improvement and quality control and assurance. We recognize that this um, efforts around quality is an aspect of building back better and ensuring that we are promoting the resilience of the health system um, so that we support essential maternal newborn and child health services during this time and going forward. We want to call attention to um, the quality of care standards for maternal newborn care, which were issued in 2016, and for pediatric and adolescent care, which were launched in 2018, and that those are represent some guiding um, documents which of course we can share the links to in uh, the community of practice or in the chat here, um, but would like to make sure that you all are aware of those documents. Next slide, Ben. In this series, um, focused on quality essential maternal newborn and child health services, we want to highlight the need for the and the opportunities to maintain and strengthen quality of care in the context of the pandemic, and to share global guidance and learn from countries on approaches to maintain quality essential MNCH services. This is, uh, as Benny mentioned, a series in which we have covered other topics, including infection prevention control, um, emergency triage and treatment, uh, triage and assessment, uh, maternal care, and now today on oxygen. Over to Anna. Next slide. Thanks, Pavani. So in today's webinar, we will discuss oxygen systems and oxygen therapy. Oxygen is a crucial gap, all too often preventing the delivery of quality of care for sick newborns and children. It's a gap that now receives a lot of attention as it is crucial for the care of patients with COVID-19. So the investments that are made into the scale up of oxygen for the COVID-19 response really provide an opportunity to build better health systems and to improve the overall quality of care beyond COVID and for the future. We are Really glad to have two great sets of presenters. We will start with Dr. Hamish Graham from the Center for International Child Health at the University of Melbourne. 
who will introduce the topic and together with Professor Falade from the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria and the Oxygen for Life Initiative, um, the experience from Nigeria on policies and strategies to improve access to quality oxygen therapy. After them, Dunasia Bayanama, a health facility specialist from the Clinical and Public Health Services General Directorate in the Ministry of Health Rwanda, and Anike Shimwe, a medical equipment engineer from the Rwanda Biomedical Center at the Ministry of Health, will share Rwanda's strategy to improve oxygen systems and their approach, approach to improve clinical care for women, newborns, and children, and how the country planned for increased oxygen supplies as part of the COVID-19 response. With that, I pass it over to Hamish. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be uh, here with you today. I'm just going to try and share my screen. A real pleasure to be with you, especially because you're here because you're passionate and, and care about quality of care. Um, I think one of the fundamentals we know about quality care is that it really hinges on doing the basics well and maintaining these basics even during a pandemic. Now, oxygen is a really ex good example of this, both the challenges of this and some of the opportunities uh, of this. And today I'll be sharing some, hopefully some practical tips on doing oxygen well. Many of these were true before COVID, are especially true during COVID, and hopefully you'll all take something practical away uh, uh, for, from the presentation today. Now, these tips are from uh, experience of a lot of people, and I'm really pleased to be here with Professor Faladi, um, who's, who I've been working with uh, for quite some time now in Nigeria. Now, I'd like to start by focusing our attention on a child. This is Amana, who's an infant who presented to a small hospital with pneumonia. You can see in the left panel, she's very unwell, she's breathing fast, breathing very difficult, and that flashing purple number on the pulse oximeter in front of her is showing a blood oxygen level of 51, 52%, very, very low. The middle panel is the same child just a couple of minutes later. Um, now still very sick, but blood oxygen level 98% and hooked up to some oxygen uh, via the nasal prongs. The right panel shows that she's receiving this oxygen from an oxygen concentrator with a flow rate of just half a litre per minute, per minute. And I want to start with this for two reasons. Firstly, it reminds us that oxygen is a life-saving essential medicine. Uh, given to the right child at the right time, it can really be the difference between life and death. But secondly, I show this because we really need to keep children like this at the centre of our discussions when it comes to talking about oxygen access. Too often we talk about oxygen access in depersonalised or abstract terms, focusing too much on equipment and not enough on patients. So this might sound obvious, but when we um, started working in uh, 12 hospitals in Ni Nigeria uh, about five years ago, we uh, did a survey and we asked, we started by asking the question that is on most of the surveys, do you have oxygen equipment? And the vast majority of hospitals said yes. But when we started to dig deeper, we found that, that the situation wasn't actually that great. Only about half of facilities had oxygen available in the ne neonatal or paediatric areas. Only about 20% had staff who had pulse oximeter, had uh, any sort of training or protocols. Uh, and the end result was the vast majority of children who needed oxygen were not getting it. Now this tells me two things. Firstly, that oxygen access is probably worse than most of us think. And second, if we only ask those binary questions of do you have oxygen equipment, then we're really missing the, the, true, um, the true story. And unfortunately, we're still seeing that um, binary question of do you have oxygen on many of the surveys uh, with regard to COVID and, and COVID preparedness. 
Now, add to this the disruption of a COVID pandemic with diversion away from essential maternal and newborn services, and this situation sounds pretty terrible. But I'm actually an optimist, and I believe that every health facility, every government, every country has significant capacity around oxygen. And I really believe that as disruptive as COVID is, it's also an opportunity for us to build back better. Now today I want to touch briefly on five areas where we can where we can improve oxygen systems, sharing some practical strategies that have been proven effective before, uh, using examples mostly from Nigeria. I can't cover it in detail, but hopefully it'll be a start of a conversation that we can we can follow up with more resources. All right, so let's start with identifying the children who need oxygen. We know that low blood oxygen levels are very common in children who are admitted to hospital. And our surveys are around about a quarter of sick neonates and about one in five, one in six, six sick infants had low blood oxygen when they were admitted to hospital. We know that blood, low blood oxygen levels are deadly, increasing the risk of death around six or seven fold. And the lower your blood oxygen level is, the higher your risk of death. And we also know that low blood oxygen is very difficult to detect using clinical science. Now, all this means that pulse oximetry is really essential. Um, you probably all know this pulse oximeter that the nurse is holding here in this picture has been around for a long time and it non-invasively uh, non -invasively measures a patient's blood oxygen level. But even though we've had pulse oximeters for a long time, if you walk into most hospitals in Nigeria, the nurses would be entirely unfamiliar with using pulse oximeters and perhaps unless they'd worked in the operating theatre. But our experience in Nigeria also showed that once we introduced pulse oximeters, the whole way that oxygen was used changed. And indeed, the biggest improvements in oxygen access came not from in introducing better oxygen sources, but from making pulse oximetry a routine practice. So in a time of COVID, pulse oximetry should be a very highest priority. It's affordable, it's available, manufacturers have massively ramped up production uh, in recent months and they have supplies available. And using pulse oximetry will ensure that we direct scarce oxygen resources to the patients who really need it. And I can't emphasize this enough. So if you're not already doing pulse oximetry routinely on all sick newborns and children, we really need to start doing it. What about oxygen supply? Well, there's lots more detail in the WHO specifications, but just to touch on a few things. When we talk about medical grade oxygen, we're talking about oxygen with a purity of greater than 82%. Now you might think, well, why not 99, 100%? Well, greater than 82% is more than enough for standard oxygen use for patients, whether it's low flow, CPAP, or even ventilation. Reality is we don't want high concentration oxygen hitting the lungs, that's dangerous. We want it to either mix in the, in the nasopharynx when we're using nasal prongs or a mask, or in, when you're using CPAP or ventilation, we intentionally mix it so that FO2, the inhaled oxygen, is lower, is safer. And regardless of what oxygen source you're using, whether it's cylinders, concentrates, and oxygen plant, the oxygen uh, purity that you're likely to get is pretty similar, around 90, 95%. And that's basically because it's coming from the same process, a process which takes air from the, from the atmosphere, takes out the nitrogen, and you're left with around about 95, 90 to 95% oxygen. Now you can get oxygen from lots of different sources uh, and each have their pros and cons. Some have much bigger upfront costs, but others end up being much more costly over time. Now I can't talk through these in detail today, but just to make a couple of quick comments. So cylinders you'd all be familiar with, um, very useful for smaller facilities and as a backup, but are typically a relatively expensive source um, of oxygen. Uh, oxygen concentrators uh, have, have been quite a, a well-promoted um, solution, particularly in COVID, uh, because they are they are much easier to set up than, say, an full oxygen plant, and they're generally significantly more um, and more and more affordable um, over time than uh, cylinders. When you're getting to bigger hospitals, then that's when oxygen plants and even liquid oxygen become important, uh, but they're difficult to scale up um, quickly. They have certainly a lead time. 
So the messages here is when we're thinking about equipment, we need to get to know each of the equipment that we're looking at, choose quality, use it to its full capacity, and certainly cost it over its full life cycle. Now on to healthcare workers. Now, again, much more detail in these WHO guidelines, but there's oxygen is a medication that needs to be used safely. There's really just three pitfalls. You can give not enough when patients are needing it. You can give too much. Um, I, t I mentioned pre just before about oxygen toxicity. The big concern for our group is retinopathy of prematurity and we've seen epidemics in many parts of the world as oxygen has become uh, more available. And this is why for preterm small neonates, the recommendation is to, to target a lower saturation um, around 88 to 94 percent, trying not to let it get above 95 percent. There can also be problems of being too variable in, in oxygen pr product, um, provision. And I like this quote from Scott Haldane, who's really the, the father of oxygen therapy, describing it like bringing a drowning man up to breathe and pushing him under again. And unfortunately, that's what we do when we're using unreliable oxygen sources that go on and off, or we're not using pulse oximetry and we're just giving whatever amount of oxygen we think um, might be good. So how do we put that into um, practice? Pulse oximetry, again. Secondly, using clinical guidelines. Um, and these need to be simple guidelines that nurses and, and low-level healthcare workers can be confident in um, starting and um, changing uh, oxygen to need. Uh, thirdly, using the right sort of delivery equipment. So for, for infants, neonates, children, we're usually thinking about nasal prongs or nasal catheters. I put a comment here about humidifiers just because I know there's uh, uh, concerns around humidifiers as an infection uh, risk and I share that concern and just wanted to say that we don't need humidifiers unless we're using higher than, higher than usual um, flow rates. And finally, if we are using high flow or CPAP, we don't want to be using just oxygen. We want to be using air or an air oxygen mix. What about technicians and biomed engineers? Too often, these uh, people are left out of discussion around oxygen. They're not consulted when oxygen equipment is bought. They're not told when new equipment is, arrives and they're really only called when things break down. And this makes for very poor relationships between staff and also a very dysfunctional oxygen system. Technicians, engineers can really do magical things with oxygen equipment if they're included as part of the team. Um, here you can see a concentrator-based system in a hospital in Nigeria uh, with the engineer standing uh, beside it. Uh, and you can see it's in addition to a good quality oxygen concentrator with reliable power supply and power protect protection. It has a flow meter stand and simple tubing that allows sharing oxygen from the single concentrator to five beds simultaneously. It's located conveniently for nurses away from patients for easier infection control. It groups the sickest patients together for easier monitoring, and it has the oxygen flow chart displayed prominently for quick reference. It's got a maintenance checklist for nurses to tick off each week, and it's got scheduled preventive maintenance that the technician does every month or so. The concentrator has a fixed position, making it less likely to, to wander. And these are all simple things that make a big difference to a nurse who's trying to provide quality clean um, care with oxygen. Now, this is a general paediatric ward, but we've adapted similar setups for isolation hospitals, including adult wards, and UNICEF and WHO has produced some guidelines around this sort of uh, setup for, for COVID isolation centres. So lesson here is involve technicians from the start, problem solve together to find innovative uh, solutions that suit your local context. Now, finally, a brief comment on oxygen systems. In the time of COVID, this is where things really become make or break. It's really great seeing more oxygen resources and equipment coming in, but these will only be truly effective and sustainable if they contribute to better oxygen systems, if they build on what's already here. Now, we've talked about a few of these elements, um, but I just really wanted to encourage us as we think about this, is to invest, think about investing in a system, not individual bits of equipment. Now, I'm not a particular um, proponent of any particular setup. Different setups work in different contexts and you all know your context better. But I would say we need to listen, think about all these particular aspects, planning, 
uh, financing, particularly whole of life costing, how we select and procure quality device and have appropriate support. Uh, how we train healthcare workers, how we train and support technicians, how we make sure maintenance is done and spare parts are available, um, and how we continue thinking of ways to improve the system. Now on that note, I wanna hand over to Professor Falati to give a bit more insight into how things are on the ground in Nigeria, including in some of the hospitals we've, we've partnered with recently. So over to you, Prof. Thank you very much, Dr. Amish. Uh, Nigeria has strong policies relating to oxygen, including the national strategy for the scale up of oxygen at air facilities, which was launched in 2017 uh, by the former Minister of Air, Professor Isaac Adewoli. This strategy considers all the essential elements of strong hospital oxygen system, as Amish has described. Unfortunately, it has not been funded or implemented, leaving individual hospitals to continue struggling with oxygen on their own. In the context of COVID-19, the Federal Minister of Health reconvened the United for Oxygen Working Group to try and reinvigorate the national oxygen strategy. I work at the University College Hospital but a formal stationary center. In March 2020, with lockdown in Nigeria, the number of patients attending our pediatric clinics of usage ibadan fell drastically. However, during this period, pediatricians, we pediatricians were putting calls across to the parents and guardians of our patients to prescribe refill drugs for the sick children, and consultation via telephone calls were made. By May 2020, Patients were gradually returning to the clinics, but still much less than during the pre-COVID-19 period. At the University College Hospital Ibado, no oxygen therapy from oxygen cylinder is diverted from children to adults, as the wards taking care of the patients work independently, and patients pay for oxygen. For instance, a big cylinder of oxygen lasting 48 hours for a toddler costs 7,500 Naira, which is approximately 19 US dollars. Additionally, the oxygen supply to the oxygen to the children is supplemented with that from two 10 liter oxygen concentrators powered by hybrid solar system. This was installed by Oxygen for Life Initiative uh, last year. In 2017, we formed a non profit organization called Oxygen for Life Initiative to provide support to hospitals and governments seeking to improve oxygen system. We currently support 26 hospitals across five states in Nigeria in the Southwest, including four isolation centers. And all these facilities are happy with the oxygen system and support that Oxygen for Life initiative has provided during the pandemic. Currently, we do not have experience of facilities that vaccine the oxygen equipment away from children. This may be because of our inclusive engagement, that we, inclusive engagement side. We do all the installations and training together with the facility technicians and clinical staff. However, these activities remain dependent on funding from doctors and hospitals without organized government support. That foundation in Australia donated equipment. Hospitals contribute to other installation essentials and oxygen for life bear the cost of installation and training. This is far from ideal and we continue to work with state and federal governments to encourage a better system approach to oxygen. Over to you, Amish. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. So this has been a, a really rapid race through some of the practicalities of getting oxygen to every child who needs it, but hopefully there'll be something that you can take away from this. Um, I'm gonna leave you with this uh, uh, summary take home messages and some resources. Uh, the collection up the top has a few things that we've created um, based off WHO, largely based off WHO and UNICEF uh, resources, and you'll find uh, many other resources in the WHO medical devices link here as well. 
So on that note, thank you. And it's my pleasure to hand you over to Donatian and Anik uh, with further insights from Rwanda. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm greeting to all. Uh, we are going to present to you a uh, Rwanda plan to increase access to medical oxygen. And uh, during our presentation, we are going to share uh, our experience as a Rwanda country, the work we have been done as a Minister of Health to establish oxygen system, to strengthen our health system, and also the strategy we have put in our effort to help in readiness uh, during uh, uh, this COVID-19. We will also share our practical experience with our system uh, to support maternal neonatal child health in the context of uh, uh, For the moment, my colleague, Anik, we're going to present, we're going to present the, the first three slides. By the bread. Continue. Because I'm leaving actually. Anik, the role is yours. Where are you going? Hello, everybody. My name is Anik, and I'm a biomedical engineer at the Rwanda Biomedical Center. I'll be presenting the first few slides of our presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, this slide basically explains the current situation of oxygen plants. Oh, sorry, the previous one, the previous one. Previous slide, please. Yes, just there. So this is the current situation of our um, Oxygen infrastructure. Sorry, the the first slide. The yes. Second. Yes, the second slide. Yes, just there. So as you can see, this is the current situation of our oxygen plants within the country, where you can see our functional plants in green, non-functional in red, and proposed oxygen oxygen plants in blue. As you can see, most of the functional oxygen plants are concentrated within the city of Kigali. And we have two other functional ones in the north and one at the referral hospital in the south, uh, one non-functional one in the east, and we are proposing one in the west. As you can see, it's the only one there and uh, one in the east as well. So we currently have 508 health centers, 30, 37 district hospitals, four provincial hospitals, and eight referrals. Our maximum oxygen production capacity if all of our plants were fully functional, would be 355 cylinders, 50 liter cylinders per day, or about 10,000 cylinders per month. But due to many factors, uh, a lot of our plants are just not as functional as they could be. And our current uh, capacity is about uh, 230 cylinders per day, about 7,000 cylinders per month. Our functional plants are operating at only 65% of their total capacity. And a lot of them are run by people in the private sector. So making our current plants more functional than they are now is a very, very important thing for us. Next slide, please. Uh, through um, a number of studies and speaking to people at the hospitals and just observing by ourselves, we've identified some key barriers in um, just providing safe oxygen therapy to patients within random public hospitals and health centers. So we lack protocols and SOPs. As of now, we don't have dedicated protocol and standard operating procedures for medical oxygen quality control, supply management, uh, training as well. And 33% of our surveyed hospitals reported that they did not have adequate and sufficient job aid and clinical protocols and guidelines, basically telling them how and when, which quantities to use oxygen within their wards. 
Another barrier that we face at administrative level is our procurement process. In, uh, in the public sector here in Rwanda, our procurement is, is open procurement, just to give a chance to as many people as possible to be able to supply us with our needs. But what that means is that the procurement process is very long, meaning if you have an emergency and you need to buy uh, this or that, it's going to take a very long period of time to get what you need, and that means people aren't getting the care that they need. Uh, financial barriers are also a very big deal for us. Currently, we charge oxygen. The tariffs of oxygen are per amount of time rather than per amount of oxygen. Um, as you know, different people consume oxygen at different um, rates, which means that discharging people doesn't mean that you're getting an accurate idea of what's going on. And since hospitals depend on that revenue to be able to do maintenance or buy more equipment or spare parts, this means that uh, the tariffs are a setback for us. Maintenance budgets are also a very big issue. Oxygen plants, concentrators, piping, all of this needs to be regularly maintained and that costs money and hospitals aren't able to create the revenue that they need to be able to take on that expense by themselves. Also in random health facilities, uh, electricity is charged at a, a normal rate. They don't have their own special rates, which means that they'd have more access. And uh, we've been making a few proposals to have hospitals be charged an in industrial electricity fee, which is lower. Also transport costs, especially in remote areas, especially in the West where the terrain is a bit more tricky than the rest of the, con of the country is very high, which means that when private suppliers are supplying hospitals in those areas with um, oxygen, the cost is significantly higher. Uh, equipment and infrastructure, functional equipment, and also the quality of the equipment can be an issue. We lack cylinders and not just cylinders but also modern cylinders with content meters at the moment most hospitals that you go to the cylinders don't have content meters so you're operating on on trust and you're trusting that they filled them up as they should be but we should be able to counter verify we also lack pulse oximetry devices vital sign monitors and all of these things that go hand in hand with supply of oxygen and at the moment, all new hospitals in Rwanda are built with piping, with oxygen piping. So everything's connected to a manifold and you're good to go. You don't have to connect individual equipment into concentrators or cylinders, anything like that. But older hospitals do not have piping or they'll only have piping in certain wards, especially in neonatology. But we would like to have more piping in our hospitals so that you can ensure the quality and deliver of oxygen. Spare parts procurement, as we mentioned earlier, procurement process is still an issue. And not only is the process a problem, it's also the availability of, of those spare parts on the random market, which will mean further delays and, um, and um, compromising the quality of care. And then human resources. Um, currently, hosp public hospitals, in district hospitals in Rwanda only have one biomedical technician staff, sometimes it's an engineer, and that person is in charge of all medical equipment uh, needs. So we don't think that number is enough and it doesn't ensure that the equipment is well maintained, including oxygen equipment. And then when they, they, the, the technicians are available, they're not suitably trained. What ends up happening is that whoever supplies the equipment, it is required, we require them to train our technicians, but the Training is just upon installation, it is not a continuous training, so you cannot guarantee that the technician knows everything that they need to know uh, to be able to maintain that medical no, no, equipment. No, no. The, I think because I'm using... Uh, then clinicians as well require some training to know how, how much oxygen, to... under which circumstances, uh, what to do in case of emergencies, and so on and so forth. So specialized training are definitely a problem and it's something that we are working towards rectifying. Uh, next slide, please. So we've considered all of those uh, issues in our, in our systems. Uh, first thing is standards and SOPs. We have to develop job aids for medical oxygen use that are geared towards clinicians and technicians as well. Uh, standard operating procedures for management for distribution. Ideally, we'd like our plants in the public sector to supply oxygen to other health centers. So distribution has to have uh, 
guiding principles. We also are working towards supplier pre-qualification, which means that for someone to come and run a plant, we need the supplier to be as good as they can be so that we know that in case of emergency, they can handle it, they can handle training and all of their equipment is up to par. We are also developing minimum standards for medical oxygen equipment, including concentrators, pulse oximetry, and um, con uh, yes, that's it. Medical oxygen plants, we simply just don't have enough. So on top of needing new plants, we also want to make sure that the plants we do have are being utilized at 100% so that we can build on what we already have. Uh, through our survey, we realized that the Western province and the Eastern province are the most in need. And that is where we would like to have a new high capacity oxygen plants, as well as in the city of Kigali. Financial sustainability, we are updating, we would like to update oxygen therapy ther uh, tariffs to really reflect the usage. So that helps everyone at the end of the day because hospitals can then cover their costs and be able to uh, do maintenance as they should. We, with a standard price per litre uh, for public uh, hospitals. The cost of maintenance contracts is also a very big problem for us. And we've observed in other, other equipment that's not just oxygen related that when you consolidate these contracts, so you do a contract for a whole area, not just hospital by hospital, the prices go down. And that is one of the strategies that we'll be using. We are also advocating for a reduction in electricity costs to um, the entity in charge. Equipment, we are equipping health facilities so that they are able to, even if they don't have all the oxygen equipment that they have, that they are able to diagnose and stabilize patients until they're able to transfer them so we can uh, reduce cases where the people don't make it. We are also phasing out concentrators from hospitals. Although they are currently helping us, ideally would like all of our all of our hospitals to have just piped oxygen that comes from a steady and controlled source and not have to rely on concentrators and the that will also come with streamlining the logistics of spare parts because if you have if we're working in a systems approach then spare parts will be considered and suppliers will have to keep them uh, at a lower cost and nearby in the market Yes, so, so some of the older hospitals, we want to retrofit piping. So the ones that we've identified as having a high oxygen consumption and also maternity blocks in most hospitals right now are covered, but we'd like to cover uh, those that haven't been covered yet. Training, would like to do more trainings for clinicians and biomedical technicians so that maintenance is really covered. We can see, we can know that our biomedical engineers and technicians know what they're doing in terms of oxygen and they have um, a say during procurement and distribution and because they use this equipment every day and they are really well with the right skills. They'll be very, very helpful to clinicians and patients as well. Uh, thank you very much. I'll be handing over to my colleague Donatia now. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Yannick, for your presentation. Once again, uh, hi everybody. I'm Donatian from Ministry of Health. I'm a health facility specialist. I'm going to continue to our presentation by giving you a, an overview of Rwanda preparedness and response uh, during COVID-19. Uh, first of all, our, the first case of COVID-19 in Rwanda was confirmed on 19th March 2020. And uh, since that time, Rwanda has put in place measures for this outbreak prevention and control. A national COVID-19 task force uh, has been put in place uh, to coordinate emergency response, including developing guidelines and SOP. Uh, a nationwide the capacity building plan for COVID prevention and management was also developed to ensure the entire health system. Uh, it is where uh, the, the, the people are well known on, on skill to protect the healthcare providers and everyone who visits our health facility. And there is also enough capacity of healthcare workers in all health facilities in, in Rwanda on COVID-19. 
uh, in surveillance, case detection, uh, contact tracing, reporting, uh, IPC and case management for COVID. And also there is uh, maintaining essential health services uh, during COVID-19 in Rwanda context, uh, including Matano Neonato Child Health Program. Uh, the next slide, the next slide we are going to, next please. Uh, this slide, we are going to show how we maintain maternal neonatal child health services during COVID-19 in our country. Uh, we used first the ministerial instruction on how continue to continue of all health services during the lockdown we've emphasized on uh, uh, the productive maternal, newborn, child and adolescent health. We didn't stop during this, uh, the lockdown. We used to also the guideline for community health workers on not interruption of those services to reproductive and maternal, uh, newborn and child and adolescent health services and protective measures to observe. We provided also the PPE to, uh, to support the, the service, uh, health providers, and also we provide the mask to the community health workers those are the people who are helped a lot our Rwanda health system uh, in the community, those community health workers. Mm -hmm. We also, um, we have also done a screening at the entrance of all health facility. Before we enter in our health facility, we have to be screened. We continue also uh, the radio airing and the TV spot of message related to seek uh, the, those services uh, in our, our facility. We use also social media to provide the message related to seek those services, and we push up supply of commodities. Uh, of course, we, we change of school-based provision of during HBV vaccination services to the community provision, and we do regular visit of household uh, by those community health workers countrywide. Next, please. Next slide. Uh, to improve access to oxygen care for newborn and child and children, uh, we build the capacity of health providers on quick treat of children who need oxygen first. And then we provide oxygen concentrator to pediatric and neonatology department. Uh, we also ensure availability of Referral equipment for newborn child in a critical condition requiring continuous provision of oxygen. And also we continue mentorship by professional association. Uh, those professional association we uh, involved in, in this program are uh, Rwanda Pediatric Association. There is Rwanda uh, Medical Association. And also we have Rwanda Society of uh, Obstetric and Gynecology for and, that, and in regard to the management of hypoxemia and pneumonia. Next, please. Next. Uh, now uh, we, we, we have uh, planned, the key planning guiding to integrate oxygen supply into our health system for, uh, of course, COVID-19 responses. Uh, we, we have conducted, we plan to conduct a rapid capacity assessment to ensure the quantity current of oxygen demand and forecast the demand side caused by COVID epidemic in the whole country, Rwanda. Uh, we conducted, we plan to conduct a rapid assessment of our current oxygen generation capacity uh, in our hospitals. And also we, we plan to estimate the gap between the COVID related oxygen need as the, the demand has been um, uh, increased and the current oxygen generation capacity you have in the country as uh, uh, my colleague presented. We plan also to evaluate the values of oxygen source and the delivery infrastructure option to bridge this gap. Uh, in this, we have to, to invest. We have to invest in our capacity by repairing existing non-function equipment and we max or existing the oxygen plant capacity uh, to procure 
the key missing equipment, spare parts and the consumable, and also to strengthen the current oxygen supply chain in, in the whole country. Of course, with a map of available capacity in the neighboring country in case needed. Uh, and also uh, for extra capacity, we, we plan to design the largest investment in line with the national strategy to respond to, to the strategy as my colleague presented before and phase in, 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 in invest, large investment to avoid wastage of resource, of course, and create opportunity for a deployment. Uh, we also uh, plan to place purchase order for similar no-brainer, of course, device. Uh, example, setting up uh, the ICU bed and related equipment, area enough to mitigate the impact of long lead time during COVID. Uh, for next, please. Uh, for our ongoing activity uh, for now, uh, of course, prior to COVID-19, uh, our hospital um, are piped, uh, the, the hospital piping, our piping was initiated and the department in the maternal neonatal child health services are priority, are the, 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 the priority. Uh, for the moment, 45% of all hospital in Rwanda are at least one department piped and the 45% of piped hospital have all department piped. Uh, among the piped hospital, 94% have a neonatology department piped and 76% for maternity and pediatric ward. All new hospital for the moment uh, are being built in, in the country. We have a new uh, project for constructing new hospitals and the, the, with oxygen piped installed uh, uh, during the, the construction. Uh, also, during the COVID-19 outbreak, the, 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 the clinical guideline SOP and job aid for oxygen therapy in hospital have been developed, of course, to, to guide our uh, healthcare providers on how to, to, to manage, to, to respond to diagnosis, uh, for example, hypoxemia and provide the correct uh, services into validation process. The clinician also, uh, we have also uh, think on uh, training for our clinicians uh, by a varying training module and checklist the, which have been developed, of course, to, to ensure if our clinician staff know how to appropriately uh, respond in this uh, moment, specifically uh, for quality medical oxygen therapy to our patient. Uh, also for uh, uh, hypoxemia screening is done and oxygen therapy training has joined the nation wide uh, for capacity building plan for COVID-19 prevention and management training package. Uh, next, please. Uh, also we conduct the rapid, uh, as I said, <clears throat> assessment of current oxygen generation capacity and the quantity and the cost, the main, uh, the main oxygen rest, of course, the device and the consumable required to meet the, the peak of uh, this pandemic demand in the country, uh, of course, including the biomedical equipment inventory. We also uh, conduct a demanded side assessment uh, to build on the national roadmap policy and recommendation and engage and coordinate stakeholders to work to, toward the national plan to increase access to oxygen therapy in short term, intermediate term, and long term planning. Next, please. Donatien, uh, Mr. Bayama, we need to wrap up so we have some time for the question from the participants still, because we have a lot of questions coming in. Yeah, I think I'm at the, at the end of my presentation. Yeah. Okay. I'm at the end. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now hand over for the question and answers. A lot of you have typed your question in the chat box already, and my colleague uh, Anne Detienne and Pavani Ram are going to summarize and read them out. Over to you. Thank you very much, and thanks to all of the panelists for sharing your excellent presentations. Um, we're going to start with the first question, uh, since this is the Quality of Care Network for Mothers, Newborns, and Children, um, and uh, we wanted to talk about um, anecdotal reports uh, of oxygen being removed from pediatric and neonatal wards um, and how kind of to prior to ensure 
sustained availability of oxygen supplies for managing respiratory conditions in newborns and children during this difficult time when there is such an expanded need. Um, so uh, over to Donatien and Dr. Falade to talk about ensuring oxygen supplies for newborns and children. Donatien, Dr. Falade, yeah, you need to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Anik, you can go ahead for the comment. Uh, I'm so sorry. Please repeat that. Sure. So how can we ensure oxygen supplies for newborns and children when we have uh, this increased demand? And how do we prevent sort of diversion of resources, if feasible, or reduce diversion of resources, if feasible? Okay, uh, I know Donatien will help me with answering that, but I know that uh, in our context, maternal, neonatal, and child health programs, when we were, I think you mean in the context of COVID, when we were making our plans for COVID, we made sure that we weren't taking resources away, we were just adding resources into the COVID context. So the oxygen uh, supply lines for hospitals and health centers have remained as they were. We weren't diverting any resources. We just, uh, one of our plants in Kigali was uh, scaled up. The one at the military hospital was scaled up. So that was handling all of our COVID um, related oxygen needs. Luckily, we haven't had a lot of patients that required oxygen therapy. We've been very lucky in that way. And that's how we've managed it as of now. I'm sure Donation has something to add. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Of, of of course. Of course. We with the the current capacity of oxygen we have, we 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 are now uh, in a sufficient capacity to to respond to the demand uh, from our our hospitals countrywide. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I think we're moving to the next question just to be able to uh, respond to more. So that goes to you, Hamish. Um, and there was just a quick question on commenting on the indication for continuous pulse oximetry rather than spot checks. Um, and if you could talk a little bit about the potential advantage or opportunity in using multimodal devices that can measure pulse oximetry plus uh, respiratory rate as compared to pulse oximetry only. Yeah, they're, they're excellent questions. Um, I'll answer briefly, but we've done some specific work around um, when who needs uh, more intensive uh, uh, monitoring, which I can send you details later. Um, so I think I'd say a couple of things. Firstly, WHO guidelines just suggest monitoring, spot check monitoring all patients on oxygen at least twice a day, which is not very often. Um, but I think we should be clear that we're really monitoring because we might want to change something. So our work has suggested that probably once a shift for children and most neonates on oxygen is fine to keep their oxygen levels where you want it to be. The ones that ne might need more um, closer monitoring are the small and preterm neonates where you've got a tighter target range. We know that the vast majority of them if they're not uh, monitored and, and adjusted regularly, spend the vast majority of their time above the 95%, so in the too high range. Um, how often is a question that's um, a bit up for debate. I mean, there's even where they've got the resources to be able to do continuous um, monitoring. There's many people who say continuous monitoring is not necessarily the right option. It, and nurses will very quickly just switch off to alarms and not respond, respond to alarms. So I guess I'll just come back to in the context that you are, in the resources that you've had, how is it going to change? How is it going to change care? But yeah, so it'd be that really just that that small and preterm cohort that I'd be thinking about. Um, very quickly on multimodals. So multimodal devices are like pulse oximeters, which also do respiratory rate. Um, these are new devices and I think their role is still under investigation. So um, I wouldn't want to be promoting them or steering you away from them. I'd just say they're becoming more available. We'll learn more in the next few years.
Thank you very much, Hamish. Um, I wanted to go to Dr. Falani to talk about uh, you know, how much the oxygen program is vertical or how it's integrated into the newborn uh, child health programs. Um, so what challenges and opportunities are you experiencing in having a vertical program? Dr. Falati? Please, can you come again? The question is meant for me. Can you come again? Yes. So can you talk about whether the oxygen program is a very vertical, uh, unique program, uh, or if it's integrated, how much it's integrated into the newborn and child health um, programs in terms of training and uh, quality efforts? Well, thank you very much for that question. Uh, I think Amish has talked extensively about that. And uh, what we now do is that uh, the neonatal unit is well supplied with oxygen from oxygen cylinder. And we do supplement this with a uh, oxygen concentrator. And all resident doctors working in neonatal units, they are trained on oxygen therapy and when to give oxygen, when to win off oxygen, and everything. And then we have also biomedical engineers that are readily available to take care of the oxygen concentrators. I don't know whether I've answered your question. That's helpful. Thank you. Anna? Yeah. So um, the next question goes to Ani. Um, Anik, there was a question on, on uh, solutions to ensure continuity of electricity, given the frequent disruptions of power that we see in many countries. Um, and then I'm adding uh, the question on uh, why concentrators are being phased out in Rwanda um, and whether there was a specific budget set aside for oxygen during the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, so regarding continuity of electricity. Uh, okay. okay. All health facilities in Rwanda have high power generators. That's something that all of them have, and it's a priority when we are building the hospital. And even in retrospect, that's something we um, consider all the time. For hospitals that have piped oxygen connected to manifolds, or uh, we like where possible, we tend to have because um, you, you have two types of manifolds, they can be either automatic or manual, and we try to use the types where we know that it's likely that there's a lot of disruption, especially like in the East where the power supply is a bit shaky, we tend to use manual ones where they, they won't require um, oxygen. No, sorry, they won't require electricity. Regarding the budget, uh, oxygen was considered, yes, there was a budget set aside because because when we were purchasing ventilators, uh, we considered their oxygen needs and they were part of that budget. Uh, concentrators. <laughs> Con our main issue with concentrators right now is that the maintenance of oxygen concentrators is a very big burden. A lot of them have been, were donated or acquired on one-time grants, which means that after the warranty per period has expired, they don't have maintenance contracts. There are just so many brands and the local capacity to maintain those concentrators isn't there. We are trying to solve the oxygen problem in a systemic way, and we think having piped oxygen as opposed to concentrators will provide a, a better solution because then maintenance contracts can be drafted up. And since there are not so many brands, uh, it will be a better solution for us. We think uh, maintenance in that case will be a smoother process. And that's why we are considering phasing out concentrators. I hope that answers your question. Thanks so much, Anik. Uh, and we'll have one last question and, and bring it back to Hamish to talk about safety. Hamish, can you comment about, there's a question about how common is uh, harm from too much oxygen in newborn settings? Uh, really good question. So just to focus, I guess, on ROP, retinopathy of prematurity. Um, I mentioned earlier, there's been epidemics of ROP in various parts of the world as oxygen has become more available. I think the current numbers um, is something like 30, 35,000 uh, children end up blind because of retinopathy of prematurity each year. And currently that biggest burden lies in Latin America uh, and uh, East Asia. It's predicted that in the next decade, that burden will shift to Africa. So we'll see 
potentially tens of thousands of neonates in Africa ending up blind because of retinopathy of prematurity. Um, mm -hmm. if, we, if we do not um, do, if we do uh, much better in, in terms of restricted oxygen to this, uh, to this group. Now, this is always a balance uh, between mortality and complications, and even the big trials have tried to work out what balance is appropriate. But I think it's very clear that if you're introducing oxygen into a hospital, into a system for the first time, it has to be done with pulse oximetry, and it has to be done with guidelines that set a ret restricted uh, target for the pre and uh, the preterm small neonates. Thank you very much. Hamish and everybody, we thank you for participating in this webinar. We're closing the question and answer session now, but all remaining questions, and if you have additional questions, will be answered in the community of practice. And Benedict placed uh, the link to join the community of practice uh, into the chat box. We wanted to make you aware of two guidance documents that came out to support the continuation of essential health services during COVID. Um, one based on community-based healthcare and then the overall operational guidance for continuation of essential health services. Next slide. So if you want to hear um, or see the presentations from the previous webinars, um, there is a link to where you can access the whole series. We are going to take a break in August but you can register now for the next webinar which will take place on the 3rd of September. Um, and uh, will uh, focus on, on health worker perspectives, challenges and solutions on delivering essential services. Um, join the community of practice, continue asking questions. Um, and there's also the information for joining the Child Health Task Force. For those of you with a specific interest in pediatric quality of care, you can join the pediatric quality of care subgroup. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye, thank you so much.